Welcome back to the Warbird Mistress for the long-awaited, admittedly, part four of the Pentology, and then some, that is Luftwaffe at sea. This episode, Holding Patterns, is about the middle years of the war, when the tide was beginning to turn, the war in Africa was lost, the U-boats had lost their edge, and the building Allied air supremacy in the lead-up to Normandy was changing the way Germany and her Luftwaffe were waging war. Now, as in all the other videos in this series, we begin by looking at the new inventory that was entering the Luftwaffe at this point in the war. And out of these aircraft, there's a single example that I have to say I will not be discussing, only because it is tangentially considered a maritime aircraft, but not really. And that is the Messerschmitt ME-264. While two prototypes were built, it was only as an afterthought that a maritime role was considered. Therefore, I felt it should be noted but not discuss, since there's much more fun to be had, especially since now we're really getting into rotary wing craft. And we begin with an old standard, the Junkers U-88. Now, we've covered her before, and as a medium bomber, she was absolutely one of the best assets for the Luftwaffe in her maritime exploits. Since the onset of the war, her worth as a dive bombing, glide bombing, and patrol platform was indisputable. What we're really here to discuss is the introduction of new variants meant specifically for maritime duty. These modified, streamlined designs were the A-17 and H variants. So first, uh, let's go with the Junkers U-88 A-17. This was the primary torpedo bomber of the Luftwaffe in the Mediterranean, and the Junkers A-17s were converted A-4 airframes with the gondola and the outboard bomb pylons removed and torpedo shackles taking the place of where those double bomb pylons had been. Each one carried a single large torpedo, and to facilitate torpedo management in flight, especially gyro adjustment, a control panel on the starboard deck of the crew compartment was installed. Each torpedo weighed approximately 1,700 pounds, and was either the German Lufttorpedo F-5B, or the successful Italian aerial torpedo designated Lufttorpedo F-5W. How these torpedoes were deployed is something we'll get into at the end when I go into the career of Oberstleutnant, later Generalleutnant, Martin Harlinghausen, a perhaps most influential maritime aviator in Germany and one of the few people to stand boldly before Göring and really describe the truth of the war, but we'll get to that. So operationally, the U-88A-17 acquitted herself well on nearly every front, especially in the Mediterranean where most missions took place as well as in the Arctic and in the Bay of Biscay. Deployed against targets in the Mediterranean and in the constant fight for North African supply lines, the struggle for Malta, she flew alongside the Regia Aeronautica, and she did exceedingly well. Likewise, in northern climes, she was able to hunt down Allied shipping with minimal losses and excellent reliability. She was user-friendly and liked by her crews, though the numbers manufactured were small, it was only in the loss of control over the Bay of Biscay, the invasion of Normandy, and the success of Operation Dragoon that she really lost her role in the war. But that really was when the maritime role of the Luftwaffe was declining in general, and we'll get to that later when we talk about some of the operations during that time. So anyway, the quality of the crews mattered only in terms of survivability rather than mission success. And this is one of those things that you don't think of is that the torpedoes left much to be desired. All in all, it was a successful variant that even saw post-war service, with at least one pair of them being put into service in the colors of the Aero Naval, but the fact that it was a survivable aircraft in combat, that the aircraft could put up with a lot of the stressors that the Luftwaffe was facing at the time, just both in combat and in terms of maintenance and usability, that mattered a lot more because it was only as good as the torpedoes it got, and that was something that the Luftwaffe really could not guarantee at that point. Now, the other maritime variant of the U-88 were the H. And these were long-range maritime reconnaissance aircraft that not only had radar, but remotely controlled cameras as well. Of the four distinct H variants, the H-1 was strictly recon. The H-2 variant was designed the same as the H-1, with the long fuselage of the U-88 D-1, once they were developed, and the wings and engines of a G-1, but the H-2 was strictly a day fighter without any radar on hand. 
She was heavily armed with a half dozen fixed MG 151 stroke 20 20 mm cannon, which were used to engage long range convoy aircraft such as the Catalina or Sunderland, and two cannon were in the fuselage, while the others were in underwing pods, one pair to port and another to starboard. And the H1 and H2 models flew with Fliegerführer Atlantic in small numbers. These were not a, a large run. The H3 variant was designed for recon and had even longer range than the H1, with expanded fuel tanks taking up most of the fuselage, and only the prototype was ever completed. And finally, there was the H4. This was intended as a heavy fighter in a kind of maritime Zerstöhe role, but the lineage of Junkers 88 fighters kind of died out with the H3, as this never went any further than the drawing board. In that same family tree, though, we have the U-188A3. This was the Reicher, or Avenger. This was also specifically a torpedo bomber. Of the 1,200 or so U-188s that entered service beginning in February 1943, the radar-equipped torpedo bomber A3 variant was only a small production run. More than half the 188s made were long-range reconnaissance aircraft, which, although useful for maritime recon, and used extensively in that role. It also saw service over land, especially over the home isles, and over the Soviet Union, as it could fly higher and faster than interceptors that were sent to reach her. The U-188 was a longer aircraft that mounted either BMW 801G2 engines, or Junkers Yumo 213A engines, in what they called a Kraft I, or Power Egg arrangement, that the engines were basically popped out of place, they could be repaired, maintained, etc., and then put back in. So it also led to a little bit of a difference in numbers. So the UMO-equipped A3 was essentially identical to the BMW-equipped E2. So in this case, we're just going to be talking about the both of them. These examples had the outer hardpoints removed and the inner hardpoints replaced with torpedo shackles, just like the U88 had had. Without the expanded ordnance payload of other bomber variants of the U-188, she really wasn't a great improvement over the U-88, and her wing wasn't strong enough to mount four torpedoes. So she still has the same payload, wasn't really a great um, improvement, and her top speed was 325 miles an hour, which really was the one advantage, although the torpedoes would reduce that greatly by taking away the benefits of the streamlining that she had. She did, however, have longer range, and she had a single gun dorsal turret that was placed immediately above the flexible dorsal position. So it wasn't really a great improvement, but it was at least something. And of course, she was equipped with radar, which was another big benefit. Now, the radar with which the 188A3 was equipped was the Funke 200 Hohenfeld C scanning set. The set for which was mounted on the starboard side of the glazed nose. The model was fielded by three Kampfgruppe 26, a Gruppe nearly always equipped as torpedo bombers. They received the 188A3 beginning in August of 1944 in Bavaria, before they moved to their bases in Norway at Trondheim, Badufoss, and Sola, whence they operated all over the North Atlantic. They fielded a steady 25 to 29 at any given time through to the end of the war. Most all were lost, however, between March 1945 and May of 1945. Eight to accidents, one to desertion, four to unknown causes, three to weather, one to running out of fuel, and only one to British fighters. And that was on 21st of April 1945, when Oberfeld Weber Zimmermann and his crew were shot down by mosquitoes 100 miles south of Stavanger. And that's not a bad record at all in terms of losses to enemy fighters. But when the sheer number of accidents in what was otherwise a quiet operational zone is taken into account, that speaks volumes. However, the costliest engagement of this unit in the entire existence of it would also be perhaps its most famous engagement. And that was when the unit sank the last ship that Luftwaffe torpedo bombers would in the war, the Liberty ship SS Henry Bacon. It was just after 1,500 hours Greenwich civil time on 23rd February 1945 when the Henry Bacon was spotted lagging over 50 miles behind her convoy 
and 23 U-88s and U-188s flying out of Bardafoss attacked her. What should have been an easy engagement turned into a one-hour firefight. When the naval armed guard and anti-aircraft gun crews managed to shoot down five of the bombers, all U-88s as far as unit records reflect, and this was with four twin 20mm mounts and an aft 5-inch dual-purpose gun and a 3-inch dual-purpose gun forward. Not only did the gunners, mostly coast guardsmen, but some sailors, damage four aircraft and down five, they also set off the sensitive German torpedoes by filling their paths with as much lead as possible, causing them to prematurely detonate. In the end, the ship was doomed, but her fight made her immortal. In fact, there's a great book on the matter, and uh, both the U.S. Coast Guard and U.S. Navy have accounts available online about her highly recommend at all. But that really was perhaps one of the only famous real engagement of the U-188 in the war. It was the costliest to the unit, even though no 188s were lost. And it kind of shows that if that's going to be the most famous engagement, then the Luftwaffe torpedo crews by that time were almost superfluous to the war effort. Sticking with Junkers, however, we now move on to the Junkers 290. And again, this was made in small numbers, like many of the aircraft around this time of the war, but she was an addition to the maritime arsenal. This giant was thought by the Allies to be a transport with heavy bomber capability, but in reality she would be used as a transport and glider tug with a number also serving in the maritime reconnaissance role out of the Bay of Biscay. Like the Condor before her, she was a passenger aircraft at heart. Her tremendous size may not be clear from photographs, but with a moving picture one really gets an impression of what this behemoth with a range of 3,700 miles and an empty top speed of 273 miles per hour was like. Three A-5 variants made trips to and from Manchuria in 1944 in some of the most incredible tasks of the war. The A-2 was a variant specifically designed for Atlantic patrol, and she boasted five 20mm cannon and six 13mm MG-131 machine guns in a variety of positions, including two powered turrets. Then there was the A-7. She had a glazed nose of unusual shape, as one sees here, and the A-8. The A-8 boasted 10, 10, 20mm MG-151 cannon, and between 1 and 3 13mm machine guns in what was the most gun armament carried by any bomber of any air force during the war. Now, some of these A models had anti-shipping radar sets and were armed with Henschel HS-293 guarded missiles, which is quite impressive for what is otherwise considered a little-regarded transport plane. The B model added pressurized cabins, even more fuel, radar and missile capability, and could boast a range of nearly 5,000 miles. So here we have an aircraft that, even though it was designed as a transport, and at heart was a passenger aircraft, if you really look at the design, being not only used as a maritime bomber with a range and an armament really heretofore unseen, but also what is perhaps the world's real first standoff anti-shipping aircraft, as the Henschel HS-293s could be fired from beyond the defensive capability of the ships which is attacking. You know, here you have this, this massive aircraft that could carry multiple missiles, and had it come out earlier in the war, really might have made a huge impact on the war in the Mediterranean and, of course, the war in the Atlantic, if uh, early enough. But with that, we end our adventures with the Junkers Company, and we get into some interesting stuff. Not that that wasn't interesting, but you know, this is the stuff for which I wish there was more motion picture content, and that's rotary wingcraft. And developed from the Fletner FL-265 helicopter, the Fletner FL-282 Colibri Hummingbird, was a one or two place helicopter with centrally mounted engine and intermeshing rotors, which was very typical for German aircraft. Being a totally new kind of venture in aviation, and aviation itself was only just 40 years old, we remember, the first prototype only took part in tethered ground tests, something that had really not been done before, but this, as I said, is new ground for everyone. And with 125 hours of testing, it was finally decided that the second prototype, V-2, would be used for the first free flight test, which was held on 30 October 1942. Limited in scope, it would be the third prototype that truly led the way with a factory test flight by Fletner's chief test pilot, Ludwig Hoffmann, and he brought the aircraft up to 3,800 meters, about 12,500 feet, 
in a space of 36 minutes. So it's flying higher and more efficiently, really, than most any helicopter up to that point. And in terms of lifting power and stability, it was actually ahead of its time. Test pilot Hans Fusting also showed that the aircraft could achieve stable flight without any hands on the controls. And that was so long as the speed was under 35 miles an hour or so, and that the envelope for longitudinal stability was lowest at around 20 miles per hour and lower. Now, the first four of these aircraft were completed by Anton Fletner with a glazed forward cockpit area. These were the 282A line. From the V5 forward in what would become the FL282B, the cockpit and much of the fuselage were uncovered and only the engine compartment was covered, and even then only in fabric. The final variant, the FL282B2, consisted of the V20 through V24 examples, and this was a two-seater, the observer sitting after the engine compartment facing the tail, and reduced the fuel tank from a single 105-liter tank to two 32-liter tanks on either side of the pilot. And the Colibri was certainly out to be tested. This was not going to be any chance taken by the Wehrmacht here. So the Kriegsmarine was actually in charge of this, and during the rough trials at Travemunda and at sea in the Baltic, Mediterranean, and Aegean, landing procedures were developed that involved winching the craft down with a 10-meter length of cable, with the rotor still engaged. And they found that this was the best way to counteract the pitching rolling deck of a ship. They also found at tests at Travemunda with a FW-190 that it was almost impossible to spot the aircraft from the air both due to size, construction style, and the fact that people aren't looking for rotary wing craft at this time. And both statisticians and tests with infantry weapons show that the probability of striking a critical component was significantly lower than that when targeting a fixed-wing aircraft. The blades themselves, while engaged, could also take rifle-caliber fire without sustaining any sort of notable damage, let alone experiencing structural or functional failure. And it should be noted here that the RAF found the Colibri equally difficult to destroy during the sea tests. While aboard the mine layer Drache and the auxiliary ship Bulgaria, the British took note of the 12 by 12 flight deck and the unique cargo, but despite multiple attempts to destroy it, not a single ounce of damage was done to the Colibri. In the Baltic tests in the spring of 1943, the 21st U-boat training flotilla was used to test the use of the aircraft as a spotting platform, and it was shown that submerged subs could also be spotted with ease and small depth charge dropped, or a system that they developed could be used whereby buoys with magnesium torches were dropped on them, and then that would call on nearby vessels or aircraft to address the submarine threat. So the potential for this aircraft was definitely being envisioned. However, despite a training unit being operational for shipboard duty in 1943 into 1944, it was only on land that the Colibri would see action and this was serving as an artillery spotter on the Eastern Front. And at the very end of the war, some were used to evacuate personnel, with at least one being used for a high-ranking person of dubious moral qualities who was worried about a certain Slavic force with a penchant for being poor party guests getting a hold of him. But this was not the only rotary ring craft that the Luftwaffe had, or I should say that the Kriegsmarine had, and this is going to be one of the rare instances where there actually is full cooperation between the branches. So the next aircraft is the Volker Echelis Bachstädse. It's perhaps the best-known rotary wing craft of the war. It was an unpowered gyrokite that was meant to be towed by a U-boat. The Bachstädse, which is German for a uh, Bergeronette or a wagtail, could maintain a speed at 17 miles an hour, which is about 14.5 knots. Being used on a Type 9 U-boat, this posed little problem as their surface speed at a head two-thirds was about 14 miles an hour in slower marks and about 18 miles an hour in later models, with flank speed at about 21 miles an hour in early variants to 24 miles an hour in the faster marks. So even in a relatively still wind, they could still be launched with only a brief burst at flank speed, and in a moderate wind they could be launched at cruising speed by turning into the wind. While the actual deployment numbers are not known, which is rare considering how much the Germans love to write things down, it is believed that only the D1 and D2 marks of the Type 9 were routinely assigned one of the kites. The typical speed at which stability was maintained was approximately 25 miles an hour, so only 2 miles an hour over flank speed, 
and 4-6 to six over cruising speed. Thus, it did necessitate some caution when including the wind speed in calculations, although they rarely encountered the weather that would bring them into the red line speed of 50 miles an hour, and it was at that point that structural failure could be predicted. If there was insufficient wind to launch the Bachstädse, a cord attached below the rotors could be used to start them and get them going. The kites were restrained on 150 meters of cable, so just shy of 500 feet, and this ended up offering the U-boat another 25 miles or so of visibility, which at sea, especially if you're looking for Allied escorts that might come bearing down on you, is a lot of extra space and a lot of time on your side. And in the event something was seen, a telephone line ran from the pilot to the U-boat to facilitate communications. A few authors have written of 950-foot cables being used, although most do not, and it seems only to be mentioned in the March 1990 edition of Air Power magazine, but if there is a source that shows that a much longer cable is being used, I'd love to see it. Now, these were built outside of Bremen by the Weserflugzeugbau, not far from the Bremen shipyards that were manufacturing most of the Type 9s, and about 200 were constructed before the end of the war. They could be easily stored in watertight tubes on deck, and assembly required little special training, so any able seaman should be able to help with assembly. As for flying the craft, two or three members of each U-boat's crew were trained at the wind tunnels in Chalet Moudon outside Paris. And it is really, as far as I could tell, perhaps maybe the only occasion in which non-Luftwaffe personnel were flying anything. I mean, after all, if it left the ground, Hermann Goering was in charge of it, and you could check out my Luftwaffe vs. Kriegsmarine video about that. As long as weather wasn't a problem, the Bachstädse took about four minutes to assemble and four minutes to take down. Although, in weather, it could take upwards of 20 minutes to stow away safely in the containers that were bolted after the conning tower. And that doesn't include the time it would take to safely winch in the cable. So while deploying was easy, actually taking it back in and stowing it was really the issue. And this is one of the reasons that it wasn't popular. When it was first deployed in 1942, it saw little action. In the North Atlantic, the weather and the constant risk of Allied air intervention made the use of the FA-330 a liability to the boat. In the event of a crash dive, the cable could, however, be released by the boat crew. This would leave the pilot to jettison the rotors and the rotor hub, automatically releasing a parachute that was strapped to the back of the pilot's seat, and thus leaving him in the ever-comfortable warm tropical waters of the frozen North Atlantic, to await later rescue by the U-boat. This still took time, of course. It was an impractical setup overall, and because the pilot would then be out there, it not only risked his life, but if any of it was spotted by an Allied ship or by an Allied aircraft, they would know that the U-boat was there. So in general, this was not something that people really thought to do. It's also the North Atlantic, and with the weather being a factor, visibility was not really increased as much as it could be in a better circumstance. And that better circumstance, and where the Bakshetsa did see use, was in the South Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and in the Arabian Sea approaches to the Gulf of Aden and Persian Gulf. The only documented example of the FA-330 directly contributing to the sinking of a ship was off the coast of Madagascar on 5 of August 1943. This was by U-177, captained by Corvette and Capitaine Robert Giese. This was the Eftalia Mari, it was a Greek steamer on the route of Durban, Lorenzo Marx, Suez, Alexandria. Interestingly, the FA-330 was also useful as a trade item for the men of Grupa Monsoon. These were the U-boats that were being sent out to the Dutch East Indies and connecting with the Japanese also operational in that area. At Surabaya in the Dutch East Indies, the Japanese had established a shared submarine base, and as part of that, Two Arado 196 float planes had been stationed. The FA-330 that was aboard U-862 and the one aboard U-196 were traded in exchange for an Imperial Japanese Navy Aichi E-13A Jake that was then used alongside the Arados to bolster the German patrols. At the base at Georgetown, Penang, and occupied Malaya, a similar exchange was made there as the Germans had no air assets present. Royal Dutch, Australian, and American commands were all well aware of the German and Japanese operations in the area, and the Dutch submarine HNLMS Zwarfisk even intercepted and sunk one U-boat, U-168. 
Now, this was blamed on the Japanese habit of launching anti-sub patrols only after 1100 hours. It was like clockwork. And the Allies, you know, happened to have intercepted the radio transmissions, but the Axis didn't know that and they wouldn't admit to it. So with that mindset, they felt that they had to add more air assets to protect themselves. One must wonder then how Kriegsmarine and Luftwaffe collaboration in the establishment of maritime aviation assets in the Far East could have influenced U-boat operations in this crucial area. Regardless, that's about the end of the documented use of one of the most preserved examples of World War II aviation, although it really is just a collection of pipes attached to a rotor assembly and empennage, so the reason it's one of the most preserved is just because it's easy to preserve. But that is the story of her, and I really wish there was more there, but there just isn't documentation in Kriegsmarine or Luftwaffe records, and it's a real shame in terms of what's available to the historian. Now, what is available to the historian, though, is the actual usefulness of that little Arado 196 float plane. And we've discussed, of course, this in previous episode, but it comes up now, especially because at this point in the war, its use had changed dramatically and it was still ever as useful. And one way in which it did see a new life was as a patrol interceptor in the Bay of Biscay. Five Bordfiga Gruppe 196 was reformed as the first staffel of Sea of Gruppe 128 in June 1943 and located at Ortin, or locally Orti, and was under the command of Fliegerführer Atlantic in Brest. And this little group flew a Rado 196s, a handful of Bucher 133 trainers, and they were basically sharing with the Seenotdienst. So from June through to the end of the year, no actual fighter aircraft were stationed with either the first Staffel or the second Staffel, although detachments of barely a handful of FW-190A5s and A6s had been assigned at uh, Pulmy and at Bayonne, primarily for defensive duties. The second Staffel of the unit, also formed with the same personnel, would continue to operate in the Mediterranean out of Bayer in the Côte d'Azur, and that was until August of 1944. They never converted to any other aircraft. They kept their Arado 196s until they were disbanded. The first Staffel was the primary mover and shaker here, and they operated until January of 1944, when FW-190s arrived just weeks before the redesignation of the unit to the 8th Staffel of the Schroelgeschwader 1, and the departure of the Arado float planes and the repurposed Bucher trainers. And even then, despite only a maximum of nine fighters wherever assigned to the unit, before they were moved inland to take part in the anti-partisan duties, and then integrated into the Geschwader Bongart. But in those seven months of operation, the first Staffel was tasked with protecting the U-boats at their most vulnerable part of their journeys, and intercepting Allied patrol and reconnaissance planes. And despite the difficulty of their task, they succeeded with many victories over adversaries that were more maneuverable, sturdier, and more heavily armed than their Arado float planes. Two Beauforts were shot down on 7 July 1943, five Halifaxes on 13 July 1943, a Bowfighter and a Mosquito on the 7th and 22nd of August, respectively, four more Bowfighters on the 25th of August 1943, and even a Sunderland on the 6th of January 1944. So that's certainly something. Uh, that Sunderland is definitely big game, but it was also right after the unit was redesignated as a Stroho unit, and the FW-190s had just started to take over. So it's unsure if this was being shot down by the 190s or the Arados, but regardless, this is a demonstration of one of the rare occasions where Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine collaboration was not only the order of the day, but a fruitful undertaking that prevailed against the odds. Another unit of Arado 196s that outshone itself in the interceptor role at this point in the war was Seyof Krehom's Gruppe 126, based outside of Skaramekas, which is right outside Athens. With the duty to patrol against the Allied attempts at a campaign in the Mediterranean, which I go into in the Kos and Leros video along with other exploits, they also sought to intercept what aircraft they could. From October 1943 through September 1944, Allied air presence was limited in this part of the Mediterranean, and no real fighter coverage was available. The Bowfighter heavy fighters that flew out of Alexandria were an exception, but they rarely encountered Spitfires or P-38 Lightnings. If you go through Seofko's Group of 126's war record, 
you could see a total of 13 bowfighters were shot down, despite the bowfighter being faster, more powerful, more resistant to damage, more resilient when it did take damage, and was able to go thousands of feet higher than these little float planes. Two bowfighters were shot down just above sea level on 29 October 43, seven on 1st of June 1944, two of them only 80 meters above the waves. Two more were on the 17th, and two final ones on 6 September, just before the unit was disbanded. Outfitted only with Arado 196s, this shows a great deal about the pilot's skill and determination at a time when experienced pilots were becoming ever rarer in the Luftwaffe. And this is especially so when you consider it's a unit, kind of on the outskirts of the war at that time, and outfitted with a little seaplane that lacked armor and couldn't quite reach 200 miles per hour on a good day. One could only imagine what the pilots of the bowfighters must have thought about being the victims of an aircraft that an Allied service would never have been able to perform such duties. So perhaps the 20mm cannon on the Air 196 was among the wisest decisions made in her design. Such success, however, was not universal, especially in these small units that were originally designed to be aboard warships. The use of Luftwaffe units to solve problems at sea would, for the most part, be restricted to the emergency fire brigade of the Luftwaffe, the 10th Flieger Corps. Now, the most famous maritime unit of the Luftwaffe definitely is the 10th Flieger Corps, but she wasn't even truly a maritime unit. The 10th Flieger Corps was made up of and subordinated to various units and commands and was essentially a tactical bombing force tasked with anti-shipping duties based on need using, for the most part, land-based bombers. She was formed under General Hans Gisela on 2nd October 1939, and the unit kind of spent the phony war, the Battle of Britain, and the time after that in the North Sea until December of 1940. It was then, in answer to Italian requests for support in Africa, and just over one month before the Africa Corps units would start arriving in February, that they moved into the MTO. Terrorizing Allied shipping, bombing Malta, and restricting naval activities, they flew out of Taormina and then Athens, and the 10th Flieger Corps was a vaunted force whose torpedo bombing and conventional bombing strikes wreaked havoc on Allied shipping, together with the Regia Aeronautica's SM-79 torpedo bombers, which were arguably one of the, if not the best, torpedo bombers in the war. The sheer size of the force shows what the Allies were facing. The order of battle on the 12th of January 1941 for the 10th Flieger Corps included the following. Lergeschwader 1 at Catania with 80 U-88A4s and 12 U-88D5 recons, Schwarzkampfgeschwader 1 and 2 at Trapani with 80 Junkers U87R1s. Kampfgeschwader 26 at Kolmisol with 27 Heinkel H111 H6 torpedo bombers. And Zerstuhlgeschwader 26 with 34 BF110C4 fighter bombers stationed at Palermo. The lack of single-engine fighters is interesting, although for the offensive against Malta in February and March of 1941, the BF109E7s of JG26 and JG27 did join the 10th Flieger Corps before moving closer to Tobruk to support the Italo-German front in Africa. After leaving Sicily to support the campaigns in Yugoslavia and Greece, 10th Flieger Corps would be stationed in the occupied Kingdom of Greece, where it was able to offer the Axis a strong force in the Aegean for most of the middle of the war. Strength at the end of June 1942 was 31 U88A4s and 27 U88A4 tropicals of LG-1 at Irak Leon under Obersch Franz von Bender, Aufklärungsgruppe 126, which we had just discussed, commanded by Oberstleutnant Hermann Kaiser, comprised of 63 aircraft, most of which were Arado 196A3s, together with a handful of Heinkel 60Cs, captured Fokker T8s, and BV 138C1 examples at Skaramekas, with a Staffel at Kavala, and an additional unit of AR 196A3s at Skaramekas from the second Staffel of Se Aufklärungsgruppe 125. Major Rübling commanded the second group of Kampfgruppe 100, consisting of KG 111H6 torpedo bombers at Kalamaki on Zakynthos. The second Staffel of Fernaufklärungsgruppe 123 was stationed at Castelli on Crete, with two U88 fives, two D1 tropicals, three D5 C tropicals, and four U86 R1s. Also at Castelli were the Jagdkommando Creta, but with a single pair of BF 109 F4s. It was really not much of a Jagdkommando. 
Most remarkably, 10th Flieger Corps came through with the rare moment of victory that was the Dodecanese Campaign of 8 September to 22nd November 1943. And like I said, check out my Cosaleros video for a very detailed blow-by-blow -blow of that campaign. It's not just about the air support and the paratrooper landings and things like that. There was an entire raid based on nothing but seaplanes. There was you know, an incredible air-to-air uh, -air and air-sea battles. It's, it's not been a popular video, but trust me that it's worth it. Back to the subject at hand. Following German domination of the Aegean and the decline of naval activity in the area, the 10th Flieger Corps would be restationed in the Bay of Biscay in April 1944, where they supported the largely wasteful attempts to contain the Normandy beaches' supply lines, protect U-boats in the Gascon, and finally engage in attacks against forces taking part in Operation Dragoon. After the Normandy campaign, there really was little to be done in terms of torpedo bombing, both due to supplies and Allied air supremacy. This led to conventional bombing being the focus of activity. As the war came to a close, maritime operations were of decreasing worth, and the 10th Flieger Corps' last move was inland to Wiesbaden for the last weeks of its existence. Now, as usual in most of my videos, I do kind of look at the inside of things, and I try to understand the people and the motivations behind decisions at the strategic as well as sometimes really what can only be described as the political level. And I think a perfect example of the influence of politics on the use of aviation at sea is found in the first chief of staff of Ten Flieger Corps, and that's Oberstleutnant Martin Harlinghausen, who was later Generalleutnant der Luftwaffe during the war, as well as in the post-war Luftwaffe. Now, when you hear the name, you know, General Harlinghausen, possibly he's most famous for his involvement with the two F-84s that were forced to land at uh, Berlin-Tagen in 1961, which was a huge diplomatic debacle. But he was really just a, an excellent officer that truly identified with the kind of servant leadership that was very rare in many of the air forces of the 1940s, particularly in the Luftwaffe. At first, he was a slowly promoted apolitical staff officer, and he flew missions with his men from the beginning of the war all the way to the end. From the founding of Ten Flieger Corps to the end of March 1941, Harlinghausen led the Specialized Force of Naval Aircraft as the Chief of Staff to General der Flieger Hans Gisela, who was also a naval officer who had joined the Luftwaffe, albeit in 1933. So if you've seen my Luftwaffe vs. Kriegsmarine video, it'll explain how they kind of stole a lot of the cream of the crop when it came to aviation experience, Kriegsmarine event. And Harlinghausen, you know, kind of in, in the shadow of so many others, slowly made his way to Oberst, then General, and much later in his career, General Leutnant, but he was always seen as an outsider. The key to his career and why it was the way it was is really his naval background, and both the genius and the ostracism that came with having been a Reichsmarine officer. Now, he had begun not in the Kaiserliche Marine, but in the Reichsmarine, in the post-war navy, and this Versailles limited fleet offered little opportunity for advancement. Like most of the German forces under the Weimar years, there was very little movement, contracts had to be long, the Allies thought they were, they were crippling the Germans in a lot of ways, but what they really did was create an elite. Unfortunately, that elite meant that men like Harlinghausen could not really progress, so in 1931 he decided to learn to fly, and he really was a huge proponent of the Marina Flieger Commando. And, like I said, check out my other video for why that didn't become a thing. But instead, he ended up being a Reichsmarine torpedo boat officer, and the pilot training was completely on his own dime, or Fennig, or wheelbarrow, or however they were measuring money at the time. He excelled as a skipper of a series of torpedo boats and was well acquainted with the value of hit-and-run tactics and the power that came with a well-designed torpedo that Germany just didn't have. So he joined others in this struggle for really an independent naval air force, and when it failed... He was one of those naval officers that went over to the Luftwaffe in 1935. But rather than becoming a disposable lackey like so many other former Kriegsmarine officers who found themselves in the shadow of the unfriendly Reichsmarschall's gut, he continued to make a name for himself. He was just the man for any potential development in naval aviation, and he was a huge proponent of dedicated torpedo bombing variants, like the U-88A-17 
the Heinkel HG111J and the Heinkel HG111H6. And his advocacy for an elite torpedo bombing force in the Luftwaffe began during the Spanish Civil War when he commanded anti-shipping aviation. He developed nearly all the torpedo and anti-shipping strategies and tactics for the war in collaboration with both the Kriegsmarine and the Regia Aeronautica, which was considered almost a forbidden act of fraternizing with one's own side in the world of the myopic control freak that was Goering. Harlinghausen, however, had almost a magical way of surviving and sometimes even using to his advantage the mercurial attitudes of the Reichsmarschall. And part of this was he could tap into his engagement with his men. He personally had a hand in many missions and practiced torpedo drills before passing on his theoretical and practical knowledge to his men. He developed and perfected Luftwaffe torpedo tactics such as those used unsuccessfully against PQ-17 and alongside the successful Regia Aeronautica with whom he was always in contact. At first, these tactics focused on approaching in crosshatch patterns to account for a target's evasive maneuvers, just like Japanese and American tactics had counted on. After the failures of torpedo attacks against convoy PQ-17, he insisted on a period of intensive training. He developed the tactics that came to be known as the Golden Comb. These called for distracting enemy gunners by approaching en masse in line abreast formation with the ship's silhouette against the twilight or dawn horizon, and that would disperse the defensive effort, making aim and range approximation difficult for the enemy, minimizing losses, and maximizing the likeness of a torpedo strike. In his drills, he found that the U-88 was especially suited for this as she could fly low at high or low speeds without experiencing loss of stability, thus increasing the overall quality of the launch platform as well as facilitating collaboration in the attack. Harlinghausen was a huge proponent of the U-88 and the HU-111 for maritime use. He personally engineered the procurement of appropriate variants, and he went behind the back of Göring and the RLM all the time to do this. He wanted his men to have the best, and he worked with the manufacturers to obtain this, even if it meant sidestepping the party hierarchy, his superiors, and the Führer's granted ignorance of maritime affairs. To see him in a factory would not be that odd, and he worked closely with both Junkers and Heinkel to get what his men needed. His unpopularity balanced with his skills and ability to prove his worth in such a way that his career during the war was spent being sent from one commander's staff position to another, usually put in a position where he was expected to fail, and often disappointing Göring by succeeding, or at least making the most of a bad situation. He was not only the first chief of staff for 10 Flieger Corps, he was then commander of KG-26, of Luftflotte 2, then named Fliegerführer Atlantic and stationed out of Brest. Then he became chief of staff to the General der Kampflieger, and finally, chef des Luftwaffen's Commandos Vest. It is truly he to whom we can look when seeking out the genius behind the Luftwaffe's accomplishments at sea, and ability to carry out operations despite constantly changing demands and new threats from the encroaching allies sidelining by political adversaries from within the Luftwaffe itself, and the exacerbated shortages of men and materiel that came with being in such a position. And with that, we come to the closing of our journey. I know that it took a long, long time to get this done. I apologize for that, but I sincerely hope that you've enjoyed this. I have to say that when I lost the first copy of this, my files included many colorized films, scanned documents describing specific Luftwaffe attacks at sea, even some great footage of operations in the Mediterranean. Unfortunately, when you have to redo something from absolute scratch, it's enough of a drain on what's left of my brain, and much of it I could either not again find, edit to the same quality with which I was happy the first go-round, or find a way to work into the final editing. That's okay, though. I'm sure I'll run across it again. I'm sure I'll sit there with you know, the equivalent uh, today of pen and ink and get it all done. But it'll make its way into another video. For now, look forward to the final episode, Denumo. Until then, this is Claire, and I am the Warbird Mistress. Take care.